Did you really choose to come here? Or were there in fact a whole set of external circumstances which meant that it was inevitable that you would come here? Do you have free will? Or is free will an illusion created by the brain? Is it merely the product of external circumstances acting on a complex system with this eight and a half pounds of electrified pate? Clearly our society depends on the assumption that people are responsible for their actions. We all feel that we're in control of what we do and we have to stand up and face society and take responsibility for our actions. But what are the brain processes which allow all that to work? I'm Lara Feigl, I'm from the English Department and the Centre for Humanities and Health here at King's. And together with Lisa Opinionese, author of Mad, Bad and Sad, I've been convening this series in which we've brought together neuroscientists with artists, writers, actors, musicians, um, seeing if the different disciplines which probe um, the brain right. and the mind can speak to each other. And so far, as many people know, the results have been somewhat mixed. We've had speakers accusing each other of being simplistic, um, bigoted, irrational and even incapable of passing a GCSE exam. <laughs> Today's discussion... And I, I hope, I think, I'm very optimistic about a dialogue between the two. I, but I have something in me that's very deep and dark, which I'm very worried about um, the, the fantasy that we can eliminate mystery. Um, and this is a... I, I think we have to um, content ourselves with mystery and... Some, sometimes, although much of science is to do with um, the elimination of, of, of certain aspects of it. And the underlying question that we're driving at is, where does our sense of agency come from? What gives us this feeling of, of mastery over a machine or over a, a situation or even over a person, I suppose, over, over, over our own lives? The dominant view at the moment in the field is that our experience of agency is really just a narrative that we make up after the event to explain all the scrapes and situations that we get ourselves into. My own view is that we do know something about what we're doing and how much control we have, and we know that at the point where we act. So what we're trying to do is to capture some of that uh, question in this relatively simple experiment. Now, I don't know if there are mysteries or not, but if you're a scientist, you want to avoid believing in the mystery until you have to, right? So the mystery may well be what's left over after you've reduced everything down to the simplest, most core, uh, thin experiment that you can. It may be that you still find there are phenomena that you can't explain, or there are features of our experience which, for which we can't find yet any clear neural correlate. And, Let's by all means call those mystery. Let's certainly respect mysteries. But I think the mere fact of trying to reduce a mechanism or something down to its mechanistic components is not necessarily to be seen as a threat. It might actually help to illuminate what's left over after. As you all know, the 90s were declared the decade of the brain and uh, the noughties were the decades of the mind. Um, and I think from a focus on cognition and brain abnormalities, although Patrick may connect, uh, correct me in this, neuroscientists have now also begun to research agency and uh, what they call resting states, or what might once have been called the unconscious. Many millions have been poured into this research, 
Um, and much of it has been powered, I think, by the new technologies, um, the, the visual technologies of MRI and fMRI, that functional or time-based magnetic resonance imaging, which allows us to see and map brain effects, um, just as the telescope and the microscope and indeed the photograph allowed us pioneering scientific developments in past centuries. So the key thing that you have to do today is simply watch the screen in front of you and you'll see appear a double-headed arrow which looks just like this. So what I'd like you to do then is just to uh, place your index fingers on this key and on this key. And when you see the double-headed arrow, just make up your mind according to how you feel on the spur of the moment to press with either your left hand or your right. And you'll see some colours which will flash up on the screen afterwards. And then I want you just to tell me how much control you feel you had over what happened as a consequence of your own action. We're going to present on the screen a little scale where you have to make a judgment between one and eight, where one means that you didn't really feel that you were controlling the colours that popped up at all, and eight means that you felt, yes, I was in perfect control of that colour. Uh, one of the things that I noticed, for example, is that you are always feeling relatively little control over what happened as a consequence of your action. So maybe that's just the kind of person you are. And one of the... So what does that mean? Well, <laughs> now we're able to debrief you, as we call it, and to explain what was actually going on. So each trial begins with a small cross in the centre of the screen, and that's just to make sure you're looking in the right place. And then we very briefly flash up what we call the subliminal prime, and that's just a briefly presented arrow pointing to the left or to the right. And it flashes up so quickly that you can't consciously see which way it's pointing. But it's processed by your visual system and the information is available in your brain because when we subsequently ask you to decide whether to press with your left or right hand with that go signal, that double-headed arrow, if we had shown you a subliminal prime to the left, you'd be more likely to press with your left hand than if we had shown you a subliminal prime to the right. One thing that comes out of our experimental results is that people feel less sense of control when we've primed them to the left, but they end up going to the right. So at one level, you could say such a person is kind of in conflict about what to do. And so the, the feeling of, of agency and of being in charge of your life, if you like, um, goes with, with fluency and mastery, and it doesn't go with conflict. So at that point, that's perhaps slightly contrary to the way that we often think about free will as the assertion of the individual over the present circumstances. Our experimental data suggests that it's more about the harmony of the individual with the setting in which they uh, are found. I came away from that thinking, I'm a natural rebel. I didn't even know that. <laughs> but the rebel feels they have control. This is, this is what I'm trying to understand. I mean, the rebel who says, no, I'm not going to follow that, feels they have more control. So you're saying something slightly different from what we generally understand. Yeah, I think the result is quite paradoxical because one might have expected <coughs> that you feel in control when you assert something inside yourself against all the suggestions that the environment is giving you. But what we found is exactly the opposite. You feel more in control when you sort of fluently flow your actions according to the harmonious suggestions of the world around you. In other words, when you have no free will, you feel more in control. It's everything that happens is fixed by what happened before it then we cannot really be in control of what we do. If everything you did today was fixed by things that happened yesterday of various kinds. Those things were, were fixed by things that happened before them. Those things were fixed by the things that happened before them, going back to before you were born, going back to before there were any people. 
if that's true, that everything that was happened was, that was fixed by what happened before it, then it seems that our decisions, too, were fixed. And if our decisions were fixed, then they're not under our control. And that's the quite, that's quite <coughs> general problem about the very possibility of free will, of real control, uh, which is independent of any experiment. I'm not criticizing the experiment, I'm just saying the experiment is going to say that we don't have free will. I can, I can argue that we don't have free will without performing the experiment. The unconscious mind is only accessible through the conscious mind. But the problem is that the, that the conscious mind, that part of us that's conscious, doesn't want to help. And if, for example, consciousness is merely a product of the evolution of the brain and a, a, an extraordinary evolutionary byproduct, and the brain itself is just a machine, surely we could therefore create a machine which could create consciousness. Perhaps it's not so special after all. How do we still allow the concept of the individual person uh, with their individual dignity and their um, individual freedoms, how do we allow that to remain key to our human nature while also recognizing that there's a sense in which we are brain machines? What happens with any play of Racine is that nothing has been determined until it is put into language. And the minute somebody say something, says something, you've started this whole tragedy. In other words, there is um, the possibility of infinite, there are infinite possibilities of actions until something has been said. And the minute it's been said, something has been determined by the process of saying it. And in some way, the freedom of that, if, if we want to use those terms, or the agency of that person, seems to disappear the more they speak. I mean, I call it the, the reverse of the talking cure. You know, you talk and you go straight into disaster. You know, this is <laughs> result. So that's, that's another thing that, that um, I think really interests me, because we haven't talked about language and what language does and how language, what, the, what freedom we have in language. I mean, we have the freedom to, to speak or not to speak, but once we start speaking, are we diminishing this freedom in some way? And that, I think, is, is, is quite a problem because we see that when we go to war, you know, that the more rhetoric comes out, the less chance there is to sort of change the course of history. The world might be giving us a lot of subliminal priming. A lot of our life yeah. might be have been primed. I think that, if you like, you can see a lot of education as being social constraint on the will. You know, you may want to do that, but that's not acceptable. And my personal view is that, that the will can be trained and our ability to choose can be trained. I think that's fantastic because that allows us, it allows individuals to become compatible in a sense with societies. But it, I think it's really important to remember that that depends on equal access to those educational opportunities. Not educational opportunities, but sort of opportunities to learn what is and isn't an appropriate action. Mm -hmm. So I think it's essential to consider, does somebody have the chance to learn what's right and wrong? If they do have the chance to learn what's right and wrong, then you might expect their, their will to have been trained, and maybe that means that there are a bunch of things that we would like to do, but we can't because they're not acceptable. They, for example, they might damage somebody else's interests, and then that's fine. But when you have somebody who's not had those learning opportunities, who, who, who's, who, whose will has not had the, if you like, that moulding that's required to, to get it to fit well with, with society, then I think you're in a very different, different situation. So one thing that I would like to hear much more about in the dialogue between neuroscience and law is access to equal opportunity. The question of saying, are you in control or are you not in control, couldn't be also, are you feeling good or are you not feeling good? I mean, that, but that has to do with language, whether you've just, you know, there's something in the experiment, in the very use of your language, which isn't quite, I wouldn't say not truthful, but which could be understood in a different way. Yeah. But. I work in the theatre, 
The word theatre comes from the Greek teatros, meaning the seeing place. But I always feel that that means the place of understanding. I too think of the theatre as a kind of laboratory sometimes. Will this performance work, I think to myself, night after night? What is it doing? And how strange it is that we are making something completely illusory and fake in which an entire audience gather together and pretend that it is real. There were also uses and objections to uses of metaphors from systems of human communication. Words like program, code, information, transcription, encryption, message, translation were not invented to describe either the operation of the neurons of the brain or the physical mechanisms of computing machines. They derived from factual descriptions of writing and speaking, from human language talking about itself. I am A.S. Byatt. I'm a writer, and I'm in a state of panic because I think I've lost my handbag in the loo, um, <laughs> which was going to cause me to be distracted. Um, I am here on this panel because I think that constructing complicated and lengthy fictions um, is a form of disorder of the brain. Thank you very much. Uh, do we really have a handbag problem? Yeah. Very good. <laughs> you can see I'm disordered. Here's an object. Tony's my dad. I'm a 12-month-old, or slightly younger, and I'm interested in this object, but I'm not sure about it. And I look to Tony, and if Tony looks at me and then looks at the object and smiles, I'm likely to go forward and explore. If Tony shows disgust or a fearful reaction, I will back off. Now this is what I think pre-inferential, affectively grounded mode of relating to Tony's relation to the world such that the world comes to fall under a different description for me. It moves from being mildly interesting to being an object, a source of fear. It has become a frightening object. And I think this happens actually in a different way than me just finding out that it's frightening, that is that I register, even as a 12-month-old, that it is through another that I have learned about this object. And the vital importance of this, which gets elaborated over the succeeding six to nine months into the second year, is that the world has, is becoming not just a world for me, but a world in which I can take alternative stances through other people, and constantly we do this, you're doing this as you listen to me, on a shared world. Now, if you're debarred in large part, not completely, from that kind of experience, then it affects not only your social life, obviously enough, but also this experience of a shared, multiply referenced world that you're constantly engaged with in alternative ways, even within your own mind, as well as through other people. This is a painting by Patrick Heron an abstract painting, and he said his paintings were entirely abstract, and it's to do with the balance of the colours. If you put the orange colour next to the dark purple, it will look different from if it's next to the pale blue. Somebody said to him, it's not totally abstract, you live in St Ives and you constantly do, as it were, abstractions of harbours and inlets, and he agreed that this was the case. Um, when I first agreed to do this paper, Lisa Opinionese said, well, start by saying how you make up characters, when I said I'm not a neuroscientist. And I showed you these images because how I make up characters isn't much to do with what you might think it is. I don't look at my friends and neighbours and say, I could put you in a book. <laughs> Indeed, a lot of my books are full of the horror of people who have been put in books. I just wait till I get three or four or six or eight examples of the same, as it were, motion of the mind. And then I build a new character which grows out of an abstraction into a concrete thing. Still Life was meant to be a book without metaphor because I was obsessed with whether metaphor was a form of treachery or danger, as some philosophers believe. Um, so I was going to write a book about birth, copulation and death as T.S. Eliot put it, with no metaphors, and I could not do it. <laughs> <laughs>
my mind, this caused me to go right backwards and think the nature of language possibly is metaphor. There was a time when psychoanalysts, Sigmund Freud himself, had been neurologists, had looked for things like the repeating compulsion in the closed circuit firing of neurons. But now the human sciences had backed away from neurology. This was at least partly because they disliked the metaphors. It was very hard to make a philosophy of mind that was not simply a criticism of particular language. He himself was interested in a science of mind that dealt with things that were only approximately objects of language at all, which brings me back to the inside of my own brain. It is essentially an instrument for language. Perhaps what makes it, what makes mental illness, especially psychosis and schizophrenia, an illness, a disorder, um, is precisely because that search for some sort of meaning uh, breaks down. And of course, um, Jaspers made that a sort of defining characteristic of it. So, you know, that, that, that to some people is why uh, accepting a biological explanation for disorder is so unsatisfying and, and seems, seems cheap. Uh, and seems to be to lack an explanatory power, and and yet uh, that doesn't mean it's not true. And in fact, that's probably it. Probably is true. It's probably precisely because we can never. There, there comes a time when we can't really understand these states of mind um, in a meaningful, causal way uh, that makes them makes it madness. The Neanderthal brain, supposedly, was structured in a very different way, so that it was curiously more joined up and less separate, and a Neanderthaler looking at a man only saw a man. But we are able to say, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more beautiful. We can compare a human being to a summer's day, but equally, and in a more sinister way, we can think of people as not people. It is perhaps the source of all racism. And famously, Gita Sereny in her book, Into That Darkness, asked Franz Stangl, the commandant of Treblinka, how he could watch people, men, women, children, naked, being whipped and driven up a road into the gas chamber and not empathize with them. What did he see, she asked him. What was he thinking? And famously he replied, I thought of them as cargo. Shakespeare notably in the plays, people who fall in love very rarely speak to each other at all until after they've fallen in love. He never ever tries to say why they've fallen in love. They just fall in love and and probably the most relevant thing for empathy, of course, is studies of pain. So there are now lots of studies showing that we mirror pain. And the one that I did with Tanya Singer, the volunteer lay in the scanner while her friend was sitting next to her outside the scanner. And they were both wired up to receive painful shocks. And arrows on the screen in front of the volunteer indicated when the shocks would be received and by whom. And so, as you might expect, when the volunteer receives a shock, or sees the arrow indicating the shock is coming, there's a big response in the areas of the brain concerned with emotion and pain. But in fact, the responses in these areas was equally strong when the arrow indicated that their friend would receive the shock. Now, these rapid unconscious responses can be very important for survival. A fearful face is a signal that there's something to be afraid of. And there's actually another advantage of mirroring, because when we mirror someone, we become actually more similar to them. And this makes communication and cooperation in joint tasks easier. In As You Like It, when I played Rosalind, there's a phrase that takes more breath than any other phrase, which is that Rosalind says, 
to Orlando, who's, you know, testing her whether she loves him or not. She says, no, no, Orlando. Men are April when they woo, December when they weds. May are May when it is May, but the sky changes when they are wives. And something about that phrase made me know that I could meet her. I didn't analyze it. It's nothing to do with my history or who I am. But something about the person is in profound contradiction to the rest of their behavior. And at that moment of disjuncture between what we decide they are and who they really are, in this strange vacuum is where the actress steps in. <laughs> just contrast two different traditions within psychoanalytic history, more or less one tradition which is based on a belief in empathy defined as more or less the capacity to enter into the emotional experience of someone else and to experience the same feelings that another human being has. Obviously, there are different definitions of empathy, but that's one that has been central to a particular current in analysis. And that current gained prominence in the early 1940s. By the mid-1950s, it was getting stronger and stronger. And today, there are many different traditions in the talking therapies which actually base their practice on the idea that the feelings that the analyst has, that the therapist has when they're in dialogue with a patient are accurate reflections of the internal experiences of the patient. And hence, crucial point, that these can be used as a compass in the clinical work itself. So you're using what you feel to guide your work. Now, we can perhaps talk more about that later on, but that's a really important and, in some parts of the world, dominant tradition in analytic work. The other tradition, which starts out really with Freud and continues in the Freud students, starts out with the basic assumption that there's no such thing as empathy, that it's both dangerous and, in some cases, cruel to imagine that we can know anything about the internal world, about the emotional states of another person, and that what the concept of empathy blocks the person from doing, blocks the clinician from doing, is actually listening to the patient. So it's the idea that rather than assuming that your own feelings are a true guide to what's going on in the patient's mind, you have to obliterate that and question it as much as possible, put your own feelings in question, and rather listen to what the patient is saying and make your deductions and your inferences about their emotions, perhaps, or their thought processes from speech rather than from what you feel. And that, that's a very, very important difference between two traditions in analytic work. <laughs> Fear and disgust are not simple things, they're incredibly complicated. And if you want to know something about disgust, if you listen to what people who have what are called culturally eating disorders have to say about their experiences, you'll, you'll find that they're not simple things that can be determined by a facial expression or by activity of the sympathetic nervous system. I mean, it just seems to me it's, it's like, it's just mythology to think that we can segregate these different basic feelings and study them experimentally. Rather, you have to listen to someone talk for a hell of a long time to have an idea of what exactly it is they mean or when they actually have those, those feelings. Wouldn't you say that most people are roughly the same and are pretty unhappy and pretty happy at 
during most part of their lives. And that empathy is the bit of, is the area where someone, for some unknown reason, is able to not read the obvious signal of whatever the person is giving, but is able to read the person behind the signal they're giving. And that that is why we're impressed by our own sense of empathy. But when you see the individual and uh, you're at a party, or which is maybe much near the idea of falling in love, which has at its beginning empathy, doesn't it? Is that you can see the person behind the person. Or whether the word seeing is wrong. You feel the person behind the person. You fall out of love. Well, if you're drawn to somebody, That's when you, really feel you, them, maybe. Yeah. you sense their feeling, whether they're happy or unhappy, and for some reason, it gives you pleasure, even if they're unhappy. Do you think I'm weird? Are you saying weird? It's not how I'd say it. I mean, you know, people fall in love in many different ways, and people can only realize many years later, after they've stopped seeing someone, that they actually love them. Yes, well, maybe love is too extreme a thing, but if you're in a group of people, there are some people who one feels drawn to, and some people you're not. And they're none the better nor worse people. Some, sure. in a group, sure. you know, I... Sure. I often have to meet a group of 15 new people, and I immediately know the people I'm drawn to. What is it? And play it's the result that... of empathy, is it? Well, I'm wondering. I mean, I'm asking <laughs> because you feel like it's you empathy. know these people. It's not sexual attraction. It's not. It's not any of those things. It's just I feel. I can feel their rhythm. Very often we fall in love with the way somebody turns their head. For some reason, we recognise something in the gesture, which is pretty well the same as everybody else turning their head, but it isn't. You certainly can't manipulate a hundred, three hundred or a thousand people to, to notice the way you turn your head. Uh, usually in a story, of course, somebody else is falling in love with you while you turn your head in that way. And the audience replay that in their own mind and go, oh, that's like when so-and-so turned their head and I liked it. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm, I, it's Beckett, actually, who, who really begins to do that more than any other playwright, which is rather than describe or prescribe to the audience what they should feel, there's a wonderful bit in Footfalls where a character just says, a little later, when she was quite forgotten, she began to... A little later, when as though she had never been, it never been, began to... walk at nightfall. Now, obviously, the phrasing is tell you, a little later, she began to. Then it's paused. The audience panic and think, why is there a pause? In that pause, Beckett is allowing you to have whatever feeling you have about her, but also to have whatever feeling you have about yourself. It's a sort of vacuum. It's a sort of free fall out of an airplane without a parachute. I don't know if you've seen the Disney film Brave. It's a very good film about a mother-daughter relation. And in this film, you have uh, the daughter in a royal family in Scotland, whose mother wants her to be a kind of perfect princess and marry a prince and link the two families dynastically. She's not so interested in that. She manages to get her mother turned into a bear. And a lot of the film concerns the relation of this daughter to the bear. She wants the mother changed back from the bear into her mum. But at the same time, in the scenes where the daughter and the mother are together, there's always a margin of terror for her of whether the bear will see her as an edible morsel to be devoured or whether the mother will see her as her daughter. And a lot of the drama of the film revolves around that terrifying ambiguity, not knowing what she is for the other. And from a psychoanalytic perspective, this is one of the fundamental questions that infants have to confront in their lives, in their early existence. The question of what are they for the other? And one of the ways, arguably, that we block out that terrible question is through an appeal to processes involving empathy, where we imagine we know what someone else is feeling, just as in this film. What's actually tempering for the girl is to imagine that her mother wants her to be a princess who marries a prince to join the dynasties, rather than being simply a morsel of food to be devoured. <laughs>
can imagine. That's less traumatic to imagine that you have a place in a symbolic universe rather than you're more on the side of a real object that's going to be eaten. So the analytic idea would be that the idea of empathy is something that blocks out the traumatic dimension of asking, of posing the question of what we are for the other. Again, it's interesting to look at the, the gender questions here, because one could, one could guess, in fact, that this is something that women are much more alert to and open to than men. Men tend to deny the dimension of the desire of the other. They tend to remove that question from their lives, whereas many women talk about how open the question is of what their value is for the other, what they represent, what they are for someone else, for the other, or whatever embodies the other for them. Empathy has really become to mean more than just emotional contagion. We expect the empathic person to be aware that they're responding to the emotion of the other, and also we expect them in some cases to respond appropriately to the emotion of the other. And I think this creates a major problem for these mechanisms of contagion that I've been telling you about. We might feel angry when confronted with an angry face, but is this appropriate? Should we feel afraid? And in particular, if you're, it's very difficult when confronted with an unhappy face not to feel unhappy. But this is probably the worst thing if you want to actually cheer the person up. The point of looking at someone on a stage or in a film or in a book or in a novel, usually the novel can be placed in another planet even, is that you learn something about the infinite universe that's inside your head. That's where I think the empathy is self-referential in a way, that the more you know or experience of the human condition, the more you get a chance to be the person who's had a bigger experience of the human condition without getting hurt, physically. Uh, and uh, that seems to be a good thing. But I'm not sure it makes you a nicer person. I know many very well-read people who are horrible people. <laughs> and many writers who are horrible people. And none of us seem to have any ability, when it's to our own behavior, to view it. We seem incapable of seeing ourselves. But yet, the attempt to do that seems to be what culture is, I think. And they, they don't really get they don't really get it. I have a son who has Asperger's. I imagine there's many parents. Are there a lot of people here who have someone, a loved one who's on the spectrum? Well, it's like um, oh, it's sometimes I think I didn't give birth to my son, but I found him under a spaceship and I'm raising him as my own. Um, it's like trying to put together a giant jigsaw puzzle without the benefit of the colour picture on the box. There is no owner's manual. And when you first get the diagnosis of autism, it's like a cold, sharp knife going into your heart, because that's a diagnosis that pulls you down into the dark. Um, and you know, as a mother, the first thing you experience is denial. You just think, no, he's made a mistake. You spend your entire life then ricocheting from every expert you can in the world. So Uta Frith and I created the Triangle Animations to um, tap into the everyday ability that neurotypicals, people without autism, have to see behaviour in terms of underlying mental states. So to see not just movement, but desire, um, pretense, interaction and internal states. Today we're going to look at some very short film clips and you're going to see triangles moving around on the screen. You'll see two triangles moving around together on okay. the screen and at the end I'm just going to ask you to, to tell me what you think was going on. Ready, steady? Here we go. The red triangle is quite happy in this house. I think it's a maternal triangle. Um, was home alone and the blue triangle was away and um, the red triangle seemed to be slightly isolated. Triangle. What were the triangles doing? The red squares. Mm -hmm. um, opening and closing and moving side to side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The red triangle gets a bit teed off, opens the door, 
And then the blue triangle scares him. They have a fight, and I think that's it. Mm -hmm. yep. He scared. He scared the big one, and then they 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 were laughing about it. Mm -hmm. We would expect that people with autism will find it less automatic and intuitive to attribute mental states to the triangles interacting, and particularly perhaps those rather complex mental states like um, the little one doesn't want the big one to know that he's following. Um, so these kinds of complex mental states, some people with autism can decipher through conscious effort. So what they say is that it's like doing mental arithmetic to try and work out what's going on in an interaction. Does everyone know what Asperger's is? It's, you know, it's, it, how it manifests itself is often with OCD, not very good social skills, but and also a, um, a high IQ quite often, but no filter. They say whatever they're thinking. So socially, you know, you sweat more than Paris Hilton doing a Sudoku because you never know what they're going to say. I mean, as an example, I once took him to Downing Street, Jules, when he was about 11 or something, and he met, <laughs> he met Tony Blair and he said, oh, you're the one my mother calls Tony blah, blah, blah. You know, <laughs> you know, I think, who is this child and why is he calling me mother? I mean, I have a million stories like that about what it's like raising someone on the, on the spectrum. Um, and also, you know, when you are trying to educate them, they're always, people always telling you your son's retired and he's got special needs, but even as a little baby, they say such interesting things. They have a kind of literal, natural, tangential logic, which can be quite disarmingly charming. You know, people were telling me he was retired and he would, when he was about four, he was saying to me, what's the speed of dark? And, you know, if I was chopping onions in the kitchen one day, he said, if, if onions make you cry, are they vegetables that make you happy? I mean, they're interesting questions, aren't they? <laughs> So, you know, it's a mixed bag. I suppose, uh, in the end, what I really think is that there's no such thing as normal and abnormal. I think there's ordinary and extraordinary. And people with Asperger's are quite extraordinary. But in the scramble for um, funds with all the cutbacks, kids with Asperger's are losing out because their handicap is not obvious. You know, they're not in a wheelchair, they don't have a white stick. And quite often they're going to end up living in a bedsit on benefits. And I think, you know, if we could just find a way to channel their extraordinary talents, they could contribute to society in the most fascinating way. So my son always says to me that he feels like he's drowning in his own brain waves. And I just wish there was some way I could give him. I suppose my book really was a kind of little literary life raft to help people understand Asperger's and destigmatize the condition. I first made contact with individuals with autism or those days called infantile psychosis, or that's not a term we would use today, when I was a training back in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, the children that I've seen seemed so varied that I expected to find there would be nothing distinctive in terms of what happened to them. In the event, that turned out to be quite wrong. Um, and the other was that it was really designed as a pot boiler project where I got on with the more serious work of looking at social development, which is what I was also interested in at that time. But the findings were quite striking, firstly in showing that a substantial minority of the children who had shown no neurological abnormalities when young developed epileptic seizures in late adolescence. And that really was the first indication that this was not a functional psychosis, uh, that there was some kind of organic uh, basis. The second was that the children had a quite distinctive pattern of cognitive strengths and weaknesses, and that got me interested in what that might mean and whether the cognitive features might underlie some of the social functioning, which has been studied well, most recently uh, by Francesca, but uh, by Artie Homelin and Neil O'Connor uh, before that. And the third was uh, the savant skills, uh, that in the group that we followed, there were a number who had quite outstanding skills of one kind or another. Mm -hmm. They weren't called savant skills in those days, they'd be called talents or uh, special skills of one sort or another. And so <coughs> it attracted me in terms of trying to understand better what this was all about. And that led on to other things. It's not, however, and never has been, the only thing that I've been interested in. Partly because 
the whole art of science involves comparisons. So it was crucial to be involved with comparisons with specific language impairment, with attention deficit disorder, with hyperactivity. <coughs> Partly that it was clear uh, that one needed to have other research strategies. Genetics was certainly one, so I had to become reasonably knowledgeable uh, on genetics uh, in order to do the sort of studies that seemed to me important to do. The big one was, was the mummy, and it was like, like a, like a first day of school in a new one, in a new school, and the, 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 the small one was scared. Triangle. Yeah. What were the triangles doing? Playing. It was up and down, uh, like a um, submarine's level mm -hmm. thing, and it uh, gets in, then it go uh, um, up uh, by the small box, and uh, the, the blue angle to flew away like a rocket, then the red angle, where, where, mm -hmm. where go, then done. So when you show neurotypical, ordinary volunteers, these kinds of animations as they lie in an fMRI scanner, you see areas of the brain active that have been implicated in other studies of social understanding and also of biological motion when we see living things move. Um, and also of face perception, which is interesting because the triangles don't have faces. But in adults with autism, um, who can answer quite well, we still find that there are differences in the patterns of brain activation. Um, less activation in these key regions and less connectivity, functional connectivity, between those regions working together. Mm. Does the neurological side somehow help to prove, or, or does it prove, your hunches about what's going on on a psychological level? I'm not sure that I would say that. Um, I actually think that the kinds of well-designed cognitive tasks tell us in themselves that people with autism are doing these things differently. So actually, if I am honest, if I, when we f did the first brain imaging study of theory of mind tasks, my guess was that we would see that each person with autism did the task differently, um, fitting in with this idea that they're sort of finding their own solution, they're doing mental calculation. In fact, the pattern of brain activation is not so different from neurotypical. But I think it is an important piece of the puzzle. Would you read anything about me or my history through the way in which I played in answering those triangles? Uh, probably not. It was interesting that you um, quickly assumed that the large triangle was either a mother or father. Um, that was slightly unusual. But uh, those don't tend to be the way that we, uh, we rate the performance. All of these tasks are trying to tap into that natural social instinct and automatic mind reading that seems to be problematic for people with autism. Uh, there's a big difference between knowing, being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes to know what they might be thinking and caring about what somebody is feeling. And to the extent that a person with autism recognizes what you're feeling, they will typically care about that. Yeah, over and that's very different mm. from the sort of psychopath mm. who is often very good at mind reading. In fact, mm. Machiavellian and uses mind reading to manipulate people, mm. but doesn't give a damn what you're suffering. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes these things do get smudged mm. together in the way that people talk about people with autism not having empathy, mm. but actually they're very, very distinct. Mm. I used to take great hope from thinking, well, all those mad scientists, you know, they did get married and have children and whatever. But Tony Atwood, who's a, an expert on, on autism who lives in Australia, said, but that's happening less now because, of course, women expect more from men. You know, we want our men to be emotionally articulate. And, I mean, you know, once upon a time, men that the tall, dark, handsome, silent type. So what did we, we call them the tall, handsome, you know, the tall and dark and silent? Was the norm, it didn't have to relate, but now we want men who relate to us, so there's less chance of them getting married. The rate of marriage is very low, uh, the rate of having children is very low, uh, and uh, so that raises the question, if autism is strongly influenced by genes, which it is, why does it not die out? Much of the increase is due to a broadening of the concept. It's easy to demonstrate that. Some of the increase is due to better diagnostic uh, facilities, children getting seen and properly assessed. On top of that, there may well be a real increase. Does it matter? Yes, it matters hugely. Because if there has been a huge increase, that has to be 
through some environmental risk factor, possibly in association with genetic liability, but you will have to find some kind of environmental hazard. At the moment, there really is very little idea as to what that might be, but it's worth investigating. Sometimes when I say some, something to somebody, it, do, it just doesn't make sense, but when I think about it in my mind, mm -hmm. it does, it, it, makes, it makes a lot of sense, and it's kind of like, but, but the other person doesn't realise that. And then there is a crucial question as an actor. Are we one person? Because an actor knows we are multiple selves. We are many different people. We are constantly pretending to be other people. Is that an illusion? I ask you as you sit there. Are you one person? Are you sure who you are? I have a very strong impression that I'm Simon McBurney. But I also know that this person is different when he is a son or when he is an Arsenal supporter, or when he is a father, or when he is a husband. These are multiple selves. And is that another extraordinary illusion produced by the brain? Is the male brain different to the female brain? The question that's um, been driving some of my research is this one, are there sex differences in the brain? But uh, it, I, for me, it's linked to a second question, uh, which is about the condition of autism and whether we can think of autism as an extreme of certain male typical traits. It's an idea that goes back to this man, Hans Asperger, who was a pediatrician uh, working in Austria uh, who suggested that might be the case um, from his clinical observation. And uh, it's potentially relevant because autism affects boys much more often than girls. In the 1960s, when I was growing up, we were deemed as females not only to be especially gifted at caring for the babies we had, but also associated with this with the task of housework. So women had this special inborn talent, we'd all laugh at it now, for cleaning lavatories. Men just didn't have it. Um, later on in the 80s, when women were encouraged to work outside the home, go into the city, wear big shoulder pads, do work that only men previously had been thought capable of doing, like, you know, working in the city, um, poorer people, often black or Asian, males, could be drafted in to clean your house and clean your lavatory. These days, uh, people in cultural studies might call gender a performance. And as a writer, when I'm thinking about gender, I'm thinking about history, culture, economics. And what strikes me is how much um, definitions of gender difference have shifted historically. Sometimes, I think, according to the organisations and institutions in power at the time, um, people sometimes see pictures of differences in the brain, say between men and women, and they think that that means it's hardwired or inborn. Um, that idea is outdated. We used to think we were born with all the neurons we'd ever have. That's not true, um, and we now understand that. All of our behavior is based on our brain, and our brain responds to our experience by changing. Whenever we learn something, our brain changes. So if you see a picture of a neural sex difference, that doesn't mean it implies anything about where it came from. It doesn't mean it's innate. And it's even been proposed that the sex differences we see in the brain may help the sexes to behave similarly. The subject of sex differences is very appealing to the popular press. And typically they want it to be a short, simple answer. Like it's all down to nature, or it's all down to nurture. I try to stress that it's not down to one or the other, that it's down to both. And although most people will say that's the case, the reality is that often a scientist is looking at just one part of the puzzle and they tend to overemphasize the importance of that particular part, and understandably, because that's what they're thinking about all day. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is see how the pieces fit together. Mm -hmm.
So it's generally assumed that people's gender identity leads them to like certain toys, for example, dolls or trucks. But in fact, those preferences precede an individual's gender identity. So children 12 to 24 months old already show these sex type preferences, but they can't yet say, I am a girl or I am a boy. So we're also investigating the possibility that it can work both ways, that maybe you learn who you are from what you like. One possibility that we're looking at is that there's something prenatally mm -hmm. that contributes to this sex difference in toy preferences. And we have found that there is a contribution from the early hormone environment, so mm -hmm. from testosterone in the male fetus. But then postnatally, there are other processes as well, and that's what we were looking at in this particular study. Look at these colors. Which one do you like? This one or that one? So Ivy Wong is trying to find out when does this preference for pink emerge <laughs> and what else um, might be going on in children's lives at that time mm -hmm. that might explain why it emerges. Does it have to do with their gender identification, for instance, or might it have to do with things like going to nursery school where they're exposed more to these sex type color preferences? How much about being a girl or being a boy does a child at this age understand. So by the age of two, they will understand I am a girl or I am a boy. It takes several years, though, before they understand that that's not going to change, for instance, as they get older or if they do things that the other sex does. <laughs> I think one of the things that makes us uniquely human is our awareness of our gender. Mm -hmm. I think we're the only species that identifies with their own gender, and this adds a new mechanism that doesn't happen in other species. So once you know that you're female or know that you're male, then you look around the world and you say, oh, what do other females do? What am I supposed to do if I'm female? And then you decide that you want to adopt those behaviors. <laughs> If you teach children that certain things are for their sex or for the other sex, they then usually behave in accord with those labels that they've been given. These pictures are going to tell me who should play with each of these different toys, if these toys should be played with by boys or if they should be played with by girls, okay? So who do you think should play with that balloon, that green balloon? Girls. Who should play with the silver balloon? Boys. up sometimes and think that maybe you're a boy instead of a girl? No. Okay. These tests are aimed partly at understanding how a person comes to identify with and enjoy being either male or female. And this research we hope will be relevant to instances where that doesn't happen. So instances where people feel like they would prefer to be a person of the other gender. If you could pretend to be somebody else, who would you want to be? Mm, princess. A princess. Fantastic. At the behavioural level, or cognitive level, we can also see some sex differences. This is a test of empathy. Melissa mentioned that is uh, a relevant dimension for uh, the study of sex differences. Uh, it's a test that we developed to look at quite subtle differences in the adult population where you have to look at the photo and say what you think the person in the photo is thinking or feeling uh, by picking one of the four words. Uh, women score slightly but significantly better than men on average on this test and adults with autism score even lower than uh, typical individuals, again suggesting that on this dimension they may have 
at an extreme of the male brain. So um, children can verbalize that they're male or female, girl or boy, by the, about the age of two. Maybe they know it before then and we can't measure it, but um, certainly it's there by two. But it takes them on average till about six or seven years of age to know that they aren't going to change if they do the things that the other sex typically does. And we're coming to think that not just me or my lab, but people in this field in general, that that's why children are so strict about doing gender type things. They're actually afraid that if they do other gender things, they might change into the other gender. But I, I, I read about a study where men and women did a test for, well, I think one of these tests for empathy, and the women scored much better. But then in a separate test, they were paid um, for the number they got right and the men scored equally well with, <laughs> with the women, um, which seemed to suggest that empathy is a, the, 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 the sort of the lack of male empathy is, is a kind of a, an unwillingness or a sort of a, a kind of prioritization of other, of other if the things. Stakes are high enough, yeah. you know, there may be subtle differences in terms of um, motivation, as you, as you pointed out, interests. You know, I don't think it's about ability. I think it's more about what we choose to spend time doing whether we uh, enjoy spending a lot of time in one activity or another. Uh, but, um, you know, maybe in different contexts, uh, both men and women actually, you know, give space to these different processes and to, to a different degree. So, you know, we, we, we don't stay still. We're not static mm. uh, sort of individuals. We, we act differently in different situations and in different contexts. Every valley shall be exalted, shall be exalted, shall be exalted. Most of my professional life is spent coaxing, confronting, and cajoling, cajoling my memory. For me, the great question after a lifetime of trying to research memory is where is memory between the time that we learn and the time that we remember? So every time we remember something, we remember the last time we remember. If we're not remembering the initial, the earlier event, every time we are creating memories. They're not fixed like computer memories. They're moulded by our own experience each time, each time they're remade. Uh, each time we remember, uh, we remake the memory and change the connections. The brain is this incredibly fluid thing, and memory, if you like, is something that exists now, that we are creating now, but we're also uh, remembering now. We are literally remembering, we're putting the members that we had back together, <laughs> each pattern is slightly different. At the time when these pictures were taken, Clive was in full possession of all his faculties. In fact, he had a good memory and exceptional skills in music. A brain scan would have shown no abnormalities whatsoever. In March 1985, the previously inactive virus of herpes simplex suddenly began to multiply inside his nervous system. It attacked and irreversibly damaged certain parts of his brain. The right temporal lobe, the frontal lobe, and in particular the left temporal lobe. All these areas became scarred and the holes filled up with fluid. After this almost fatal illness, physical health returned to normal, except for occasional seizures which take the form of belching. But Clive is left with a dense, and almost impenetrable amnesia. Although Clive had seen his wife earlier that morning, he greeted her as if it was the first time in years. His memory for the immediate few seconds, what William James called the specious present, is preserved. If it wasn't, he couldn't conduct a conversation. But for the reasons that Stephen was um, describing, he cannot lay down a continuous record of new episodes.
And in fact, we've done more contemporary brain scans, and he's got massive holes uh, where the memory centers are in the medial temporal lobes. On the other hand, his past knowledge, who his wife is, about Renaissance uh, composers is intact. And as you saw, he can still play the organ, even though he doesn't know that he's done so recently. And um, he's much more relaxed when he's playing the organ uh, than when he's struggling in everyday life. If I've agreed to sing some new songs, it's very different. Um, there never seems to be enough time, and the, and the prospect is quite intimidating, but the process is always pretty much the same. Sitting at the piano on my own, repeatedly singing my part, singing a, along to a recording, working with the pianist, playing my part with one finger or some of the sim simpler accompanying chords on the piano. I can't actually play the piano, but I, I can do this. Um, it seems to piece itself together in um, whatever it is, my subconscious, my unconscious, I don't know what the, the right term would be. And then very quickly, much quicker than I ever expect, it gels suddenly and achieves a usable form. Co coincidentally, that business with the one-finger piano playing tells you something about memory, I think, and the way things relate to each other. If I can play the tune with relative fluency with my one-fingered method, it usually means that, that it's, it's also anchored in my head. And somehow the physical distances between the notes on the piano keyboard and the relationship between the black and white notes has some sort of subliminal physical relationship with my vocal mind and with my vocal cords. This thing about emotional memory, that's to say when you have a strong emotion you're more likely to remember something. So if I give you a shock, for example, if I, if I was to say, look, I've got this dark blue shirt, it is dark blue, or a light blue sweater on, probably in, a, in, a, in about a, a week, probably even tomorrow, you won't in fact remember that I've got a light blue sweater. But if, for example, I gave you a shock, if I went, Bah! you know, suddenly a few people leap, now it's more likely that you'll remember I've got a blue sweater, blue sweater, ah, blue sweater, ah, it's possible, possible that now you remember something because in this shock you'll get a little squirt, there'll be a little squirt from your hippocampus and then a few connections will be made somewhere in the brain. And uh, this for me is very fascinating because not only was I interested in what uh, Stephen was saying, you know, uh, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by, by the way that uh, the history of memory research uh, uh, has arrived at this point, particularly the third point in the end of that uh, that, that Stephen was making, which was, uh, I can't remember, each time we remember we remake the memory and change the connections. Now this is really interesting because uh, this way it suddenly, there's a reason why I'm here because in other words every time we remember something we're remaking the memory we are creating the memory now of course this is uh, extremely interesting because uh, uh, um, from my point of view I remember uh, uh, going back to we all have the experience of going back to somewhere we've not been before and when we get there we go but that's that's not as I remember it well, of course it's not as you remember it, because every time you've remembered it, you've slightly changed that memory, because that memory is being recreated every time you make it. So we're quite sure about what we remember, but in fact, each time it's a new picture. Now this, for an artist, is absolutely fascinating, because if memory is creative, it's essentially the same process as the imagination. Musical form, whether it's in a simple pop song or in a Beethoven symphony, is utterly dependent on memory. We have to recognise something we've heard before, either simply repeated or recognisably changed for the music to work on us. And classical music, art music, call it what you will, works with this device of recognition as its basic stuff. And it goes even beyond this when the idea of a tradition kicks in and we can recognise quotations from pieces of music or in another piece of music or a Bach-like theme or gesture in, say, a song by Robert Schumann. I think the problem for a lot of what I think is wonderful avant-garde music is that in making that process of recognition invisible for the common listener, it throws away its capacity to connect with a wider audience. I wonder why it is that in so many cultures, and indeed our own, there is still this sense that memory is also a storehouse. This is before computers, before we have the sense that memory is actually lodged outside us.
um, into some kind of mechanical thing. And I, Stephen, and, and you, Michael, do you think there's any sense in which memory still is a storehouse, despite the plasticity that we're talking about and this constant reinvention and, and uh, imaginative aspect that it also has? Well, memories are stored, but, but they are constantly being reconstructed. So it's not a, it's not a passive, it's not a, a photographic uh, storage. And if you do tests, you can find that people make systematized errors. And actually, within societies, it's the old Bartlett stuff that as you go around telling stories, they've become more and more walked away from the original. I combined a story of memory with the discovery of the Iceman. I don't know if you remember the Iceman who was discovered in 1991 on the border between Austria and Italy, frozen in the snow, and he turned out to be 5,300 years old. And they found a little thing that looked like a kind of amulet on the end of a piece of leather. And they thought, what is this? This is some strange sort of good luck charm. And eventually they analyzed it and they discovered that it was a mushroom. And so then they analyzed this mushroom. And uh, it's 5,300 years old, and they discovered that it was a natural antibiotic. Uh, and so the last thing that I would like to say is uh, uh, we seem to remember a, a, a great many things, uh, but uh, it seems that as a society also we have forgotten a great deal. Part of the function of memory is forgetting, because if we took in everything, we would be a bit like a famous person that uh, Luria wrote up, and he had so many memories that he couldn't think in abstract, constructive way. Oh, blue shirt. Uh, <laughs> oh, that'll help me remember.